I'm going to talk about four things today, and hopefully we can generate some discussion. So really happy to um, to take some of your questions and comments after. Uh, but I'm going to go through these four things first, and then hopefully we can jump right into that. So the first is just who we are. Um, if you had not interacted with us before, I'll give you a brief overview of who Efficiency Canada is. Um, and then the bulk of the presentation is really going to be what's happening federally. I mean, I, I think you know, for those of us who've been in the sector for a while, um, are seeing a flurry of activity um, uh, at the federal level. Um, energy efficiency has never been this hot, at least in my 20 plus years in, the, uh, in this career. And, um, um, and it's an exciting time, but it's also uh, um, a heavy time because um, the stakes are so high. So I'll talk about what's happening federally both of what's being announced or has been announced and what's missing and what we're working on. And then I'm gonna just talk very briefly about kind of thinking about this a little bit differently, kind of redefining what we're doing as a, as a, a national mission that we can all get behind. And then like I do with every single presentation I give, um, I want to give some tips to all of you on how to take some action because uh, you know, we're just a small shop, we're 10 people, we don't have the capacity to do it all, and we are successful because of all of you. And so there's very easy ways that we make it um, for you to take some action. So I'll talk about a bit about that, and then we'll jump into the discussion. Okay, so let's jump in about who we are. So at Efficiency Canada, we're a national advocacy organization. Um, we're the national voice for an energy efficient economy. And everything we do is really around uh, ensuring that, that Canada takes full advantage of energy efficiency and it reaches its full potential. And the way we'll know that is if three things happen. One is that results in a sustainable environment. Number two is that Canada is transforming to have a productive economy. And then number three is that we use energy efficiency to help uh, establish a just and equitable society. So all of our work is around those kinds of three areas. As I mentioned, we are based at Carleton University um, and we're, we're sort of a part think tank, part grassroots environmental activist organization and everything in between. Um, we work on these three areas of the energy efficiency world. The first is around zero carbon buildings and facilities. The second is around figuring out how we create a net zero productive economy, meaning um, looking at things like industrial energy efficiency, but also the role that energy efficiency plays in helping every other low carbon solution uh, be that much more effective. And then the last thing we work on is meaningful careers, because the first two things don't happen unless we have a skilled and passionate uh, and excited workforce to make it happen. And so we spend a lot of time around things like workforce development, skills development, uh, and, and things like that. And the way we do our work is through three ways. We do research, so typical kind of research policy analysis. We come out with papers and reports, uh, all really kind of focusing on how Canada can transition its economy to a net zero emissions economy and the role that energy efficiency plays in that. We do a lot of communications work, um, really focused on that, on telling stories of the people in this sector. So all of you and your colleagues, there are more than 436,000 people that do this work across the country. And we want to make sure that, that, that the world knows about these people because they're adding so much value to their communities. And then the last piece is around engagement. And this is that kind of political activism piece where we're, we're trying to organize energy efficiency into a sector uh, in and of itself, and then essentially mobilize all of us so that we are loud, that we are proud about what we do, and that elected officials, policymakers hear that noise and use that um, to, to drive the policies investments that we need. So essentially what we're trying to do is build political power. And um, yeah, and we've been around since 2018. So we're still fairly young, fairly new. We're about 10 people. We've got staff across the country and um, that's how we do our work. Okay, so enough about us. Here we go, the federal policy scene. Um, you know, if, if you've been paying attention to what's been happening in the last couple of years, I think you're seeing the types of commitments uh, like this all over the world. Um, major uh, countries, major corporations are standing up and saying that, that the way we need to go in line with what uh, the Paris Agreement has said is a net zero emissions economy. So our government has done the same last fall, had declared that Canada will move towards net zero emissions in Canada by 2050 and has promised both legislation and the investment required to make that happen. So that's a very good first step. Without that step, guiding the policies and guiding the objectives of 
of the country, just like any company would. If you don't have that, then you're not going to get there. So a, a really good, valuable first step, but without the implementation, it's not much. So as we go into the next piece, what we're what what this government has done is promised to pass what's called the Canadian Net Zero Emissions Accountability Act. Uh, it's Bill C-12. It's currently in second reading, um, but essentially what it does is it legislates a set of targets every five years and forces the prime minister and the minister of finance to report on those targets every five years. So essentially enshrining in law that this net zero emissions target is policy, no matter what government is in. So that's, again, another important piece. There's a lot of discussion about, you know, how to make this act as strong as possible, but um, you know, overall, it's the next phase that gets us towards that implementation because there is some accountability assigned to it. It's not just something that was said on the campaign trail. So then we dig down a little bit deeper into what the federal government has announced on this. And then I'm gonna talk about what that means to each of you in this sector, what it means to energy efficiency and how these policies are starting to roll out from an energy efficiency lens. So uh, back in December, uh, the federal government released um, its uh, renewed climate plan. It's called a healthy environment, healthy economy. They spent a long time on this with a lot of consultation on it. Um, it's up, you know, available for anyone to read and it really kind of basically works backwards from our Paris commitment targets and what, what Canada needs to do to strengthen what was already in the books from 2015. So that was released in December with a lot of fanfare, but also with a lot of money already attached to it, some of which affects or impacts the work we all do in this sector. So I'm going to go through them. I'm breaking every single rule. Uh, <laughs> apologies to the people who did it before. I don't know if you did, but I'm, I'm right there with you. I'm breaking every rule with the number of, of words and lines <laughs> that you should put on a slide, but, but you'll see in it, it should work again. So, so we start off with zero lines on the slide, but I'm going to go walk through my colleague, Brendan Haley, developed, uh, wrote a blog called the 16 ways that this climate plan uh, has introduced policies related to energy efficiency. And so as I go through these, I'll go through them quickly, but we can talk about them in more detail if you have questions and start to think about how these types of programs and investments impact the work that you do every day in Manitoba. So the first thing is that you gotta understand is that this climate plan, the very first section, the very first priority is cutting energy waste. The recognition that energy efficiency is first before investing in other low carbon solutions or in parallel and alongside it. And I think this is an important piece because I think it is it's for the first time at least recognizing the role that energy efficiency plays in enabling the implementation of every other low carbon solution. Secondly, there was new funding for municipal and community buildings. There's now $1.5 billion available to communities to retrofit their community buildings, things like libraries, fire halls, et cetera. There's also building on previously announced investments. I'm going to talk about that in a bit, but there's programs for home retrofits and commercial buildings as well. The plan also talks about government buildings, and, and this is an interesting one because this one seems to fail on, uh, on, on implementation for decades, but they do have a commitment that they will be going net zero carbon uh, on all government buildings by 2030. That's a very aggressive timeline and a very aggressive ap approach, so we'll be monitoring that policy and that commitment as well. There is talk of a residential loan program to complement home retrofit grants, that there be a loan program uh, available to Canadians so that they can access uh, the capital they need at really low interest to undertake these uh, changes and retrofits. There was also discussion about a low income energy efficiency program, quote, coming. So uh, it recognized the need for it, but didn't was quite vague about it. I'm gonna talk about that in a bit about the things that we're doing to push for that. It talked about an infrastructure approach to energy efficiency um, and looking at buildings and treating buildings, essentially Canadian buildings as part of our infrastructure and, and treating them as infrastructure helps to better understand how you retrofit them uh, because of the common good that, 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 uh, that energy efficiency brings. Number eight is greening building supply. So recognizing that we need to start to manufacture and distribute these types of products here, things like heat pumps as a way to continue to boost Canada's economy. 
Number nine, recommitment to building codes. I think you guys have talked about that this this um, uh, either yesterday or today, but I'm going to talk a little bit about what we're seeing on the building code side, but it was recognized in the plan as well. Number 10, transportation. So uh, strong incentives and programs and investment around zero emission vehicles um, and look to what the Biden administration is going to do down south to see where Canada is going next. 11, clean power and electrification. So obviously this is top of mind for a lot of you and a lot of people who do energy efficiency is, tr is transforming our heating and our transportation towards electrification um, as a way to, um, to reduce emissions. There's a recognition of indigenous sovereignty and working with indigenous communities. Um, we've yet to see any policy announcements specifically on this, but certainly this is all connected in with housing strategies and making sure that Indigenous communities own and deliver and implement these types of programs, which I, I watched part of the previous presentation um, was a discussion here in Manitoba. Carbon pricing is a big part of this, probably the one that many of you saw and read about. The carbon price will be moving to $170 a ton uh, by 2030. This will be the largest impact on reducing the cost of electrifying heating and um, uh, um, uh, transportation, and we'll do a lot in the retrofit economy. So watch, uh, watch for that as well. Decarbonizing industry, I talked about that, and energy management systems and making sure. Training and securing benefits for underrepresented uh, Canadians was a huge part of this as well, and making sure we have the workforce. And then lastly, the provinces and recognition that provinces all have a role to play and that we need to work as a federation to achieve this. Okay, deep breath. That's a lot of things to, to think about and a lot of things to work on. But the main point, and if you take anything away from the last two slides is, this is a serious commitment to energy efficiency, probably the most we've ever seen. It's not enough to get us to net zero, but it's a huge first step to where the sector is today. And us at Efficiency Canada, we're working really hard on how we get these towards implementation strip the politics out of it and get going on a lot of these projects because we got to start this right away while we start thinking of how we get to the scale and depth that we need to be at. Okay, quickly, some investments that have been announced, the home retrofit program, $2.6 billion, the Canada Infrastructure Bank financing for commercial energy efficiency um, uh, retrofits was announced, that's $2 billion. And I mentioned this community program for municipal buildings, that's the green and inclusive buildings program, that's 1.5. So we've got $6.1 billion in the system now. If you think about, okay, what does that mean? How much is that? If you added up all of the, uh, the provincial programs and how much we spend currently in Canada just from adding up the provinces, it's about 1.5 to $1.9 billion. So we're adding in another 6 billion into the system and spreading that around and across the country. It's a huge opportunity for many of you and for the organizations that are in this sector. Okay, so what's missing? That's a lot of good stuff so far, but you know, we don't ever slow down at Efficiency Canada and we're keeping the, you know, keeping the pressure on. So there's three areas that we're advocating for for the federal budget. The first is, as I mentioned earlier, low income energy efficiency. This is a glaring um, uh, missing point in the climate plan. It didn't have a plan for it, nor did it have any money. So we've been advocating hard for this. We've been hosting events. We've been encouraging people to send letters. You can go onto our website and with one click, you can send a letter directly to your MP and that stuff really works. They do pay attention and listen to uh, those letters. The second thing, and, and this was mentioned, uh, I think earlier in, in the sessions, but um, we don't think the model building code is 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 consistent with the commitment around net zero and we actually see a uh, um <clears throat> a lot of um kind of race to the bottom on this with some special interests who are pushing for uh, example for the elimination of air tightness testing and so we're pushing hard on 
model building codes being uh, consistent with net zero emissions, but also to make sure there's enough money in the system to build out the capacity for building officials and for people in the sector to do this work. It doesn't happen on its own. We know that these codes are more complex and they are, they're putting on the shoulders of municipal officials things that they may not have the experience in doing. We have to invest in this and there's no shortage of experiences from BC to states in the US to Europe who have figured it out. And then the last thing we're, we're trying to do is develop, um, uh, uh, connect the workforce development commitments directly to the climate plan. And if Canada has a plan to hire a million people and create a million jobs, well, let's make sure those are in, in, in the sectors of where the country is going. And we think that there's a huge opportunity in every community across this country to hire and train people, uh, especially bring more women into this sector, bring in people from marginalized communities to, to get the skills they need to enter a, you know, a stable, purposeful, growing sector of energy efficiency. Okay, the last thing I'm going to say before we, we go into quick, you know, action and discussion is just redefining retrofits as a mission. So all of these things happen as kind of one off policies or one off little investments, you go budget to budget or you go, you know, campaign to campaign. And we're really trying to think about how we do this quickly and scale it up. A uh, big hero of mine is Bill McKibben. He's a, uh, an activist, environmental activist in the US and his, his quote is winning and Winning slowly on climate change is losing on climate change. We need to move fast. And so we're going to do all the things that I just did, that I said, you know, we got to scale up all our programs, the provincial programs. We're going to do all these investments federally. We're going to build the workforce. We're going to do all these things. But what we need is a unifying mission. And we need all of us to kind of come together to answer this question. You know, what would it take to retrofit every single building in Canada? And what new business models are required in order to make that happen? What new financing, what new entrepreneurial ways, what does it mean for supply chains? What kind of new skills do we need in order to make that happen? And treat this as a federal mission because we can do this. We know how to do this. The problem is not technological in any way. The problem is unifying ourselves and working within you know, the policy levers that we have, accessing the capital to make it happen and figuring out as a sector to do that. So we're gonna be coming out with something in April where we're kind of, you know, redefine energy efficiency and building retrofits as as a mission that Canada can undertake to get to the scale and depth that we need in order to be in line with what the climate crisis is telling us. Okay, so lastly, none of this happens on its own. As I said, we're 10 people, we're doing our best, we're keeping this on the, on the radar and the policy radar, but we're doing it because we have a sector of people who are in, engaged and want to help. And we're trying to make it as easy as possible to, for you to help. I already mentioned this, but please, if you can go on, sign our letter of support. It takes less than two minutes and a letter will be sent to your MP and, uh, and they will hear about this and talk about this. There's still a couple of weeks until the budget comes out and we really hope that this gets in. Secondly, we do have an allies program. So our organization, we're a nonprofit. We get some funding through some foundations. We get some funding through government. But our greatest strength is we've got 46 private sector and government allies who come in at various different levels and see that, hey, if we can support Efficiency Canada and they're successful in getting these policies, then my business, my organization can help can grow and can continue to help. And uh, we've got this great network of, you know, these 46 organizations a couple hundred people who are really coming together to drive it. So have a look at that. And then the third thing is, no matter what, go to our website and sign up for updates. We don't spam a lot. We only send one newsletter a month, but in it has all the information you need about what's going on federally, the highlights of what's happening across the country provincially and municipally, and just great stories of people like you in the sector. So please sign up. You're in our database. Then, you know, you can get the action alerts and things like that. And that is the end of my show in exactly 20 minutes as Laura asked me to do. <laughs> so thank you for listening. I really, really do appreciate it. And uh, yeah, happy to answer any questions. Incredible. Thank you so much. Well done. So again, we're going to try this uh, same uh, system of uh, you can either put your question in the chat, you can put a star in the chat or just let's like see what happens if people just unmute themselves and go for asking a question. How are folks doing? 
Uh, what was number nine again is what uh, what our graphic recorder Laura is curious about. Oh, <laughs> see, that's a sign I was going too fast. Uh, let's see. Number nine is a recommitment to building codes. And so what we saw was in the environment plan or in the climate plan, there was um, recognition about uh, Canada moving to net zero energy ready building code by 2030 and the role of working with provinces to adopt it. So enshrining that in the climate plan essentially doubles down that that is official government policy. And where we're seeing the disconnect is that once the codes commission kind of gets a hold of that, they do their thing and start to kind of draft these new model building codes. But each time they do that, it's open to more and more um, intervention from you know different special interests or provinces who may not be ready and things like that. And what we're seeing is that the latest code that's, that, that will be delivered this year is not consistent with what it says in the climate plan. So we're asking the, the federal government to figure out a way to make that happen and almost send a, a, some direction and with some budget to that codes commission so they can make it consistent. All right, Kurt, I see you wanted to talk, go for it. Yeah, thanks, Corey. Uh, I got a question. Um, yesterday, Jacob Komar gave us a presentation on, on geothermal and he, and he showed us sort of the economic uh, benefit, cost benefit between uh, retrofit, we're talking about existing building stock, uh, the, the, the considerable cost required to uh, retrofit existing building stock versus uh, uh, geothermal uh, Im implementation. How do you, is, is, is that a conflict or, or can you reconcile those two, but might seem to be conflicting ideas? Yeah, so the way we look at it is in two ways. One is, um, uh, the first thing is that um, uh, demand, so I think what you're saying is that um, you have to you have to dig and you have to build a certain system no matter how much energy you're using right and so if you cut out 40 percent of your energy usage uh first you still probably especially if you're in a house like i live in you probably have the same size of system of geothermal the way we would look at it is to kind of understand it or the way we would propose it is to understand it on a, a system-wide basis so Yes, to an individual, the capitalized cost of geothermal is high, um, but we would, and I know that, um, I'm not sure the presentation you're referring to, but HRAI, the, the HVAC Association came out with a really interesting report around what the value and benefits are gonna be system-wide across Canada for geothermal. And so what role does efficiency play in first reducing demand and then seeing how much you need to then um, build out in the geothermal or in other renewables? So there needs to be a, a connection to that. The second thing is why I don't think it's necessary contradiction is that more and more uh, what we're seeing is companies, small businesses are providing all different kinds of these solutions. It used to be there was like an insulation person and there was um, an HVAC person and there was a solar person. And now more and more we're seeing companies offering a full suite of those things. And I think actually the HVAC sector is, is really starting to try and think about how it could rebrand itself as being the low carbon solution sector and not just mechanical heating and cooling equipment because you may be providing the wrong solution when that person's there if you're not thinking of all of the other pieces. And then maybe geothermal ends up being more or less of the right solution based on looking at the building as a whole. So we're starting to see more, but we definitely need to do more on that piece, I think. Okay, great. We have a question in the chat here. On the matter of federal government accountability, is there still the plan to not have the minister stand up in parliament to report on progress until 2030? That's a good question. I don't know. I know that there was some, yes, that, that the first, um, that, that, that some of the activists who are working on it were, and maybe this is the answer to that question, we're saying that no, the first report needs to be 2025, but they made the first one be 2030 and then every five years after that. And I know that there were some people saying like, why, what's the point? Like, how will we know if we're on our way, you know, and if there's no accountability for 10 years. So the, the bill is, is still 
in a second reading. And I don't know if the other parties are pushing for that. I know the NDP had brought that up as well. So I don't know where that's at, whether or not that's still the plan or, or you know, whether they're, they're gonna budge on that one. Okay, great. Uh, will the federal loan program be modeled on PACE to ensure that the billions needed will be available by mobilizing the private capital market? If not, what insights do you have on how Canadians will be able to access the needed capital to fund all loans on demand? Yeah, so back in October, they announced the, um, uh, the home retrofit program. And in it, when they announced it in the fall economic statement, they said, we, were, we also have plans to launch alongside this a low or zero interest loan program. That was what was in the uh, Liberal campaign, and it was also in the mandate letter. But when they got to like announcing the home retrofit program, my sense was that they had not figured out this piece. And I think it's a little more complex about how they were going to do that. Certainly, there are active discussions about different options, whether they be the private sector deliver that kind of loan, like wherever you get your mortgage, having it um, go through PACE programming, which a number of um, municipalities are doing, but you need, as you know, Brian, the provincial legis enabling legislation to allow that. And there were also discussions around the role that CMHC plays in helping to backstop mortgages and could it go through that. So I don't know where that's at. They've been pretty, you know, locked in on, on their options. I don't know if that's going to show up in budget 2021. Occasionally we get asked about it and, you know, we tell them, you know, here, you know, here's some experts that you could talk to, but they, they have not, uh, they have not tipped their hand on, on, how that's going to roll out and when or, or how it is. My sense is they're going to launch this home retrofit program, get that out the door, and maybe after a year kind of layer on the loan piece to go deeper. Um, it's a pretty heavy lift to be announcing a national program and then trying to layer in a, a complex financing structure on it. And the fact that they haven't really consulted with the sector yet leads me to believe that maybe they haven't figured it out yet. All right, so we're coming close to the end. So we're gonna try and get the questions in. So Cor, if you can help with that. Uh, yeah, I'll do it fast, yeah. Thank you. Uh, can you help talk more about the three programs totaling 6.1 billion announced and how that funding relates to Manitoba? Yes, so first one is 2.6 billion for home retrofits. So this is gonna be a free energy audit and $5,000 grant available to homeowners. Uh, I've heard that this will be announced, they said this spring. So I'm hoping that in April, this gets announced, the homeowner will have to get an energy audit and, um, and based on that undertake, uh, you know, changes to their home, whether it be insulation, windows, mechanical, I, they have not announced what the full suite of products are eligible. And then they would be eligible then for the rebate after that. And then they have to get the B audit. So that's that program. The second program is the Canada Infrastructure Bank has currently has $2 billion that they're going to put towards really low interest financing for large and medium sized commercial retrofits. And what they're doing is they're asking people to aggregate portfolios of buildings, let's say 15, 20, 25 buildings and aggregate them together. They're going to put money in the system for people to go out and get those buildings and bring a portfolio together and then bring that to the Canada Infrastructure Bank so that those programs, those retrofits can be um, financed. So that's that program. And then the Green and Inclusive Communities Program is um, $1.5 billion uh, available across the country for retrofits of community buildings, libraries, fire halls, community centers, and things like that. It hasn't been announced yet, um, like what it is. They're accepting, if you look up, if you Google it, they're accepting um, kind of uh, requests for uh, RFI or whatever, just like, oh, I have X number of buildings and this is what I want to do, but they haven't said what's eligible yet. All right. So is the federal plan to rely on building codes to provide the framework for, from sustainable buildings, making green building certificates like LEED redundant? That is a great question. Um, I think over time, What's going to happen is, um, and I would look to BC first to see that. I mean, BC is not going to mandate, they have steps on their code. They're not going to mandate net zero energy ready until 2030. So there's still some time, but I would expect that um, over time buildings would have um, their own labels um, and start to track their emissions and their energy usage as well. There's only one province that has a benchmarking, um, energy benchmarking law, and that's Ontario. 
but whether or not we need these types of certifications, um, I think that you may not necessarily need the building to be certified because it needs to be a, built at net zero, but you may still need certifications for the people that are designing and implementing and delivering these types of buildings because there's going to be variations within it for a little while. Certainly passive house would be at one end and, and energy star at the other. And so within that, having those certifications probably makes sense. The other thing is those taking those certification programs gives you the skills to better understand how to build those buildings. Great, we're and I'm answering all these questions like super fast and high level. So if you want to have a deeper discussion, happy to chat. Just yeah, that's know. exactly what gathers for. So here we come in with the last one. Do you know if any Canadian jurisdictions have stopped or at least dissuaded fossil fuel infrastructure expansion into new building developments, residential or commercial? No, but uh, Vancouver, well, I do know, but none have done it yet. Vancouver and so it's happening at the municipal level, the city of Vancouver and the city of Montreal, and maybe the city of Halifax, I'll have to check have announced in their climate plans by a certain date that no new building will be able to be built with fossil fuel. Oh, well, I shouldn't say without fossil fuel infrastructure, but they, they have to be zero emissions building. So you could still have fossil fuel infrastructure and have RNG go through it, or it can be electrified. So um, it's happening at the municipal level first. There's no provinces that have, um, that have anything on the books as far as I know.